I'm an oceanographer and a climate scientist at Georgia Tech, and this is how I see the world. This is the Pacific Ocean, which covers over half of our planet in all of its splendor and determines a large portion of our climate change on this crazy planet. And I work in the smack in the middle of it on an island called Christmas Island, which is the largest coral atoll in the world. It's a beautiful place. I've been working there for 18 years now. And of course, I have fallen in love with this place, which is not hard. I hope to entrance you today with the, the splendor of this research site that I'm uh, fallen in love with. It is strewn with white sand beaches and palms overhanging them, inviting shores, uh, incredible lagoons, the and most blues I've ever seen in my entire life in one vista. Incredible place. And below ground, it's just as appetizing. We have resplendent coral reefs covering the entire island. Uh, ranging from the shallowest reefs all the way down to the depths. And we have uh, over 400 species of fish here, over 200 species of corals. These coral reefs have not been touched by much of the problems that plague so many coral reefs around the world. Relatively pristine, and it's been the subject of my work for 18 years to try to understand how they work and listen to them tell us a climate story. I build the climate story by looking at cores like this one that we drill from the modern day reef. And the ocean temperatures are recorded in geochemical variations of the core as you move down over the coral core's growth, much like an ice core or tree ring that you may be more familiar with, except this is a lot more better in terms of field work, trust me. So through cores like this, we've been amassing a climate record from this extremely remote and distant place, a place where we have so few temperature records available with which to understand climate change and variability. What those records have told us, not surprisingly, is that ocean temperatures at this place, much as they are around the world, are marching steadily up, that the recent decades of warming in this area are unprecedented in the last millennia. The thing that is most surprising and of concern is that those records also tell us that the amplitude of ocean warming extremes is increasing through time, a finding that my lab just published two years ago. That these extremes are getting larger in the last several decades than they were in the previous millennia, strongly implicating a role for greenhouse gases and driving that increase in extremes. Now, we're in the middle of a very large climate extreme right now. The current El Nino event is record breaking. It shattered ocean temperatures all across the Pacific Ocean as reflected by the red colors on this map and my research site smack in the middle of this warming. Ocean temperatures at Christmas Island have been about eight degrees Fahrenheit warmer than average for over five months now. An unprecedented stretch of thermal stress that the reef has been subjected to at Christmas Island. What we saw in November when we were there doing field work was jaw-dropping for me. I've never seen anything like this diving on these reefs as, as part of my research. What we saw is that the corals were bleached and in some cases dead. When a coral experiences such a long stretch of elevated temperatures, it expels its bright and colorful algal symbionts that give it food and it tries to remain dormant for one or two or three months until ocean temperatures return to normal and will allow that coral to resume its normal activities with its symbionts back in place. If, coral te if ocean temperatures do not come back to normal levels, of course that coral will die. What you're looking at here is a photograph from my team's field work in November of last year when we witnessed that over 90% of this particular reef was already dead. These brown plates that you see are corals that have amassed in a healthy environment for over 30 years to grow to that size. These corals are long dead. These are brown, green, covered colonies that have been dead in this photo for weeks or months prior to our arrival, caused by ocean temperatures being too warm at this site for too long. We're going back next month as a research ex expedition uh, and teaming up with coral ecologists to try to document the maximum extent of devastation that this reef experienced. We are truly prepared for the worst. I am prepared scientifically for contingencies of sampling plans that will have to account for the fact that all the corals at these reefs may very well be dead. Emotionally, I can't tell you I'm prepared for that right now. I don't know how I will feel if that's the case. It's a scientific opportunity and a lesson for us 
and I hope to bring back their story later on this spring. So, how do you feel? <laughs> I know how you feel. I've been there, we've all been there. This is yet another doomsday story about climate change. It's terrible. Just stack them up. You could play poker with the number of news stories every day that amass on our desks and on our screens about climate change. How many people in this room feel powerless in the face of such information? Raise your hands. Okay, good. How about overwhelmed by the scope of the problem? How about angry? Angry at somebody, somebody to blame somewhere for not doing something, for causing the problem, for being an obstacle. How about sad? Lots of hands. Sad for future generations. Sad for the resources that we're squandering. It's tragic. Of course we feel sad. And what about scared? Less hands, but you know, still some scared people out there. We're contemplating a future of high uncertainty. So we're certain climate change is happening. We're certain impacts will come, but we don't know what, what they are or when they're gonna roll out or how bad they're gonna be. That's not a situation that humans feel very comfortable with. It's scary. I get it. And I've been there. <laughs> I'm a climate scientist. I spend every day, all day, steeped in the data and images of climate change. It can get pretty depressing, okay, for sure. We have on the one hand, wait, the wait, the inevitably long wait for the right president, the right Congress, the right Supreme Court decision, right? And on the other hand, we have a very long and tenuous wait for the right technological breakthrough that will come and save us. Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg pouring billions of dollars into the best labs and minds of this world in that effort. We certainly need those tools, we need that hope. We, that's great stuff and I hope it goes forward and I hope it all works out, but we can't wait for that. We can't bank on that. That may never come. So what I would like you to invite you today is to think about your role for change. What if I told you that there's a way you could leave this room and feel inspired, empowered, optimistic, and yourselves become agents for change. You may not believe me, that's fair enough. I don't know if I would have believed me five or six years ago. I'm gonna tell you a story today about 30 Georgia Tech students who take my class in the spring semester, we're doing it right now, and they work diligently over a period of two months, and over two months, they identify enough carbon dioxide reductions to go out and do it and bring it back to me, and with those reductions, we're able to offset the entire class's carbon footprint for an entire year. What if I told you that that goes on every year in my class? Now, these students are not paid to do this. They have a little bit of a gun to their head with a grade. Okay, that's fair enough. <laughs> but they have real lives. They have four other courses, most engineering courses, which they care a lot more about than mine, by the way. They have girlfriends and boyfriends and take out dinners and athletic teams and they have a whole life. This is only part of what they do, yet wow, what they have done for this class. It's inspired me to come up here and talk about it to you in the hopes that it'll inspire you to reflect on what knobs you have at your disposal. We run the carbon reduction challenge every spring in my class. I kind of invented it as a what the hell thing as an instructor. I did away with all my exams and problem sets don't you just hate that anyway? And this is what we do. And I break the class into teams, and I tell them to go forth and find carbon. There are really no rules to the game, except that you can't buy your way out of your reductions. But they go out there and they identify carbon that may be at their disposal to reduce somewhere, anywhere. And not only do they have to plan it iteratively with me, but they have to go out there and do it. Get it done. And I can just see the blank expressions on their face when they're like, what, you want us to go do something? Like really, get out there and do something? Yep, go get it done. And by the way, it all has to be finished and wrapped up in a nice bow by April 30th of this semester. But that's not a lot of time, I know. Let's go, <laughs> I say. 
Our goal this year is over a million pounds of carbon dioxide reduced over the course of this semester, a goal that is very lofty indeed. That may be a meaningless number to you, but each one of you is worth approximately 40,000 pounds of carbon dioxide as an average American over one year. So one million pounds is a very large and relevant, important number. It's not small change. It matters. So this is the kind of project that the students do. This is one of my winning teams from the previous years. We partnered with a very large ball bearing manufacturing plant in South Carolina. You may say to yourself, wood pallets, ball bearings, not as sexy as solar panels, you know? But that's what this whole project is about. It's about finding the carbon in the unlikely places, at the scales that matter, and making tweaks that change the way energy is used. So we've partnered with RB uh, manufacturing, RBC uh, ball bearings, and we reduced their waste stream of wood pallets, which are over 2,000 a day. I mean, it boggles the mind, the scale. We altered their waste stream of wood pallets to a recycling facility. So instead of paying a landfill to dump their, their wood pallets in the landfill, they're getting paid to recycle their wood pallets with a regional wood pallet recycling company. In doing so, they had to put up a $10,000 cost. My students gave them the data to inform them that that would be an effective investment financially because they get $15,000 a year in savings and landfill costs. And in the meantime, every year, not that they perhaps cared about this, but I'd like to think that they did, they reduced over a million pounds of carbon dioxide by changing that waste stream of their wooden pallet use. The other thing we've done is partner with BP to make a very different kind of change, no upfront costs. You bring the case to me as a company that I'm gonna save money and save the planet, there's not much to say no to. You make it such that one of your kids is in my class and he goes to his mother at BP and we get this done. We targeted 45 floors of commercial space at BP headquarters in Houston. We convinced them to change their lighting schedule by half an hour shifting to a night schedule half an hour earlier every day for spring. And we amassed over 60,000 pounds of carbon dioxide reductions, and they saved $4,000 over the course of that two-month period. Now, they've agreed to continue to do that every spring when daylight savings rolls around. They change their lighting schedule. They've learned from this. They've learned, and it's be a permanent change the way they do things at that headquarters. And this is only, I, uh, of course, in the interest of time, I could talk about all of these lovely projects. We've made partners with the industrial sector, the commercial sector, the government sector, the, pub the public sector. We are, not, uh, we are not choosy with our partners. We partner with all kinds of folks. And we're getting this done year by year by year, building new partnerships, reducing more carbon. These are the total accomplishments that my class has made over the course of the six times that I've taught this class. You can see our relatively modest ambitions early on in the class. And now, the winning teams are very serious. The winning teams know that to win the challenge this year, they're gonna have to, their own team, reduce more than a million pounds of carbon dioxide this spring to win the challenge. Because you know what? Everybody wants to win this challenge right now, okay? So this last year that we taught it, I offset uh, and reduced the emissions of so this is reduction of emissions, CO2 avoided, of over a million pounds of carbon dioxide that will never go into the sky because of my students' activities in this class. Very proud of that fact. I think it's very inspiring. And the main message that we have from this exercise is, of course, energy efficiency. It just makes sense. It makes so much sense. And yet it is so sorely neglected in the sphere of discussions around carbon and energy alternatives and technology and Supreme Courts. This is where you and I can make a difference, it's beginning today. Thinking about the knobs that you have at your disposal, not just in your home, not just with your car, not just by voting, not just by donating to the right candidate, but by looking at the institutions that you work in, the networks that you have at your disposal. You have everything you need at your fingertips to be an agent for change in this space. This is what I do with the winning team. I take them to Washington, D.C., and I have them chat with lawmakers and staffers on Capitol Hill. We talk about energy efficiency. We talk about how it just makes sense. We urge them to consider roads that might be more bipartisan for changing the way we use energy in this country. 
and we'll keep bringing that message to them every single year with a new crop of students infused with their own success. I'd like to take a moment to talk about my kids. I have four of them. <laughs> yeah. If that is not a statement for optimism, that a climate scientist had four children, I don't really know what is, <laughs> for real. Put them out on this earth to go forward into a world of certain climate impacts. A space where I hope they will be active agents, where I hope they will not be scared into inaction and fear, where I hope they will be positive agents for change. And if I can convince you to do that, your children will thank you, and their children's children will thank you for being active agents for change, every single one of you. I want to close with bringing it back to Christmas Island, where I began as a climate scientist, where we began our foray today, and reminding you that this is a place that is only three feet higher than current sea level at a maximum height. These are the lowest lying lands of our world that I work on and call my second home. My favorite place on earth, as I tell my children, okay? These islands will go underwater within a century. I might view that as almost inevitable as a climate scientist, but the key word is almost. We have choices to make. We have a chance. We have a window. It's closing, but we still have it. Let us not wait for the technological fix that's going to make this go away like magic in 50 years. Let us not wait for the alignment of the stars of the right president, the right Congress, and the right court structures. Let us take matters into our own hands, beginning today, beginning with ourselves and the webs of knobs that we have at our disposal if we just stop and think about it in the cracks of our busy lives. They're there, they're waiting. Please join me in being agents for change. Thank you.